All right, all right. So we are starting a new series today called Make Life Better. And uh, some of the phrasing that Jesus uses in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, he asks, which of you can make your life longer by worrying? And so kind of taking that concept, I'm going to ask you this question kind of throughout this series. How can you make your life better by X, right? And I'm, I can say X because, right, I'm a mathematician here. So, uh, so that's right. The idea is like, which of you can make your life better by, by adding or subtracting certain things from it that we sometimes have the perception that will make it better, but in fact, it might be subtracting from the life that God has for us or what his best is for us. And, and so before we even get to that point in this series, today I'm going to be asking the question, uh, are we better or worse as a result of, of what we went through in the last year? All right, obviously, right, we, we tend to be a little bit more reflective during a new year, right? Today's the first of 2017. Uh, we tend to think about our lives a little bit. We, we set goals for ourselves. And, and one of the things I want us to consider is, are we better off or are we worse off as a result of what we went through last year? And, and sometimes when we think about that, we think about the things that maybe we didn't have as much control over as, as regards to what happened to us because of just living in a fallen and sinful world. Where sometimes, right, maybe if, if you got a diagnosis, right, and you had no choice in how that happened, or maybe you lost a job and it was just the way that, right, budgets went at your company, or, or maybe you got into an accident and it wasn't even your fault and, you know, just things happen, right, we, set, we sometimes measure our experiences based on these things that we were uh, not at fault for, all right? But I want us to, to consider the, the harder question, uh, which is, what about the things that maybe we were a little bit at fault for? What, what about the things in terms of, like, we've been following a strategy, a series of decisions over and over, and how are those working out for us? Are, are we better as a result of our choices to be angry, our choices to not forgive, our choices to pursue the sin that right, we have desires for? Are we better as a result of those things? And, and I like the way uh, Andy Stanley says this. He says that you were present for every one of your worst decisions, right? Like you, you, you just happen to be there every single time you made a bad choice. And so, so that's one of the things I want us to think about, not, not to dwell on, but just at least to reflect long enough that we could go forward and make life better for ourselves and make better decisions for ourselves, right? By asking the question, right, are, are my same responses, are my same choices repeated for this coming year going to end up making my life better a year from now, all right? So that's one of the things I want us to think about. And, uh, and some of us, right, like I said, it's, it's a, a culmination of our choices that allowed certain consequences to happen. And fortunately, God's grace is there. His mercy is new every morning, not just every new year, right, where God forgives us when we pursue him, right? His, his grace is available. We can just, right, run to God for just complete reconciliation, no loss in friendship when we do fail. But we hopefully will reflect long enough to make wiser choices from that point on. And, and so here's, a, here's one of the things we're thinking about. Like, are you proud of the decisions you made last year? Right now, sure, all of us, you know, have made mistakes at one point or another in the last year. Some of us, actually all of us, intentionally did the wrong thing at some point last year. But ha have you gone back to make those situations right? Have you gone back to remedy the relationships that suffered because of our choices? Have you gone back to, to write in repentance, even turning from those wrong choices? Are you making those situations right? right? Are, are, are you proud of the decisions that you made in the last year? And, and even just like that question in itself can be flawed because sometimes... People in our world, right, all of us have this tendency, we can be proud of the wrong things that we do. People can be proud of, right, the amount they drank last night or because of their sexual sin they can be proud of or they can be proud of the anger that they have. And that's not necessarily an indication that those are wise or good things to pursue, right? Fools can run headlong into their own destruction bragging the whole way. And that's not something that we should do. It says this in Psalm 94. I'll have it up on the screen. 
It says, uh, this is, uh, the psalmist is crying out to God, and he says, Arise, O judge of the earth, give the proud what they deserve. How long, O Lord, how long will the wicked be allowed to gloat? How long will they speak with arrogance? How long will these evil people boast? So, so these people are, are proud of all the things they're doing, and then it lists some of the things they do, and it's clearly not good, right? It says, they crush your people, Lord, hurting those who claim you as their own. Uh, they kill widows and foreigners and murder orphans. And they say, right, the Lord isn't looking, they say. And besides, the God of Israel doesn't care. So there are times when people make choices that are obviously the wrong choices. They know they're the wrong choices, but they're proud of them nonetheless. So don't just think about like, yeah, like I, I told that person off. That's, that's absolutely, it was the coolest moment in my life. I'm bragging about it to my friends. Like that might not be an indicator that it was a good or wise thing or making your life better as a result of that choice. But it's also possible to think that we are in the right and actually be wrong, right? That our own uh, hearts aren't always a great uh, means for discerning what is good or bad for us. Uh, it says this in Proverbs 30, 12. It says, they are pure in their own eyes, but they are filthy and unwashed, right? That, or other translations say that there's a generation that is pure in their own eyes, but, right, but they're unclean. So it's possible to think that you're in the right when, in fact, it, you might be in the wrong. And so the way we can discern what is best, what is good, is according to God's word and God's standard, not always our own hearts, because it says in Ephesians that our own hearts have at times deceitful desires, that they're deceiving ourselves from what is actually best for us. So, so here's the first passage I'm going to read. It is in Matthew chapter 6. It's on page 580 of those blue Bibles if you want to follow along. And so this is kind of going to be our, our main text throughout this series is Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And uh, this is one of the things Jesus says about this issue. He says, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And then he makes this interesting point, right? As if like, you know, we might be thinking like, yeah, I know when that happens. Like, I know whether my eye is good or bad. But he says this, and if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. So Jesus suggests that we as humanity can have the tendency to think that we are in the light when in fact maybe the light we believe we have is darkness. And, and now Luke picks up some of these snippets of sermons as well, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all gospel writers. They wrote down the story of Jesus' life. Uh, so whether Luke is summarizing the same sermon that Jesus said, or if Jesus happened to preach the same sermon because he traveled in a circuit throughout the villages in Judea, uh, this is what Luke says on this similar topic that Jesus made when he's quoting Jesus uh, in Luke 11. He says, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when it is bad, your body is filled with darkness. And check out verse 35. Here Jesus actually makes, I guess like a command almost, where he says, make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. All right, so he actually said, like, don't just like think about this from a distance, but he says, no, 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 check our own hearts. Make sure that we are living in the light. Uh, verse 36, he says, if you are filled with light with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant as though a floodlight were filling you with light. All right, so one of the things Jesus points out is it's possible to kind of be deceived by our own hearts or we don't always know what is good or better or what choices will result in good or better for us. All right, and that's one of the things that he points out. So when we think about last year, right, like I said, proud might not be the best metric to measure, right, did I make the right choices? Am I better off as a result of what I went through in 2016? All right, so... So here we go. Now, a, a, a perhaps a better question instead of are, are you proud of the choices you made or have you made right the choices you knew were wrong uh, is did you honor God with your decisions? All right? Uh, honor God. Did, did you give glory to God? Did you work as unto the Lord in, in everything that you did? And, and as far as everything we did, we didn't. All right? But can you at least look back and see the growth 
that your life has experienced as you're becoming more and more like Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart, right? That you're becoming more like Him, right? And, and it's not just something that we passively are just like on the operating table, passed out as the Holy Spirit's making us more like Jesus. It's something that we are involved in as well. It says in uh, 1 John 3 that uh, he who has this hope of seeing Jesus return, summarize, right, purifies himself just as he is pure, all right? So it's a partnership where we're working with God, becoming more like God, and he's the one that's doing the work in us, bringing it to completion, right? So, so that's the question, right? Do you honor God with your decisions? Do you honor God with your lips, the things that you say? Do you praise God with your, your voice? But also, do you avoid slander and gossip? Did you honor God with your body with respect to, right, sex or food or work or laziness, right? Are we honoring God with the vessel that we've been given? Uh, did we honor God with our, our money in terms of how we earned it, how we saved it, how we spent it, how we gave it? Did we honor God with those things? Because the purpose of this life is not one just to be lived for the sake of pleasing ourselves, Although that's often the tendency that we can slip into. Even if we set goals at the beginning of a year, we can sometimes lose sight of those goals as we get distracted by our own right desire to maintain comfort and avoid pain. We'll just kind of, I'll slip back into just, oh, am I comfortable? Okay, then that's kind of what I'll continue doing to maintain it. But, but let me ask this question. How did Jesus measure better? All right, not just in terms of the, the choices we make, but in terms of the life we live Right? Maybe you're going through a season that's difficult. Right? Maybe you're just like, I'm just glad that 2016 is over. Right? Like, that was hard. Right? And, and, and we might measure kind of the quality of the life we're in based off of what we're experiencing in the, in the now. Whether or not we're right, happy or comfortable or right, healthy and all of these things. And, and one of the passages I'm going to read today, the, the primary one I'm going to hit, is in Matthew chapter 5. And it's often referred to as the Beatitudes right, where Jesus says, right, who are those who are blessed, right? He kind of gives a series of descriptions. And this is what he says in Matthew 5, 3. So he's going to go through this list. I'm going to kind of summarize and reflect on some of these. Uh, we'll also see what Luke has to say about some of these things as well. But this is how Jesus measure, measures better or, or worse, right, in terms of where you are right now in your life. Is it better or worse? Is it blessed or or cursed sort of idea, okay? It says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs, right? So you might think like, okay, so like maybe all of 2016, I was, I was poor, I was an outcast, I did not experience a prosperous life, and you might be like, that was a terrible year. But Jesus is like, no, 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 listen up. Like, God blesses you when you find yourself in that situation. And, and, and this translation actually goes as far as to pointing out those who recognize their need for God, those who recognize their insufficiency, their own lack of capacity to provide for their own needs, right? They realize that God is the one that they have a desperate need for and that God blesses those people, right? When they realize like, God, I'm nothing without you. Right, as Jesus said in John 15, the night before he died, right, that apart from him, we can do nothing. Right? So recognizing kind of our need for God, that, that that's a blessed place to be, even when it seems as though like I'm experiencing lack right now. But I at least recognize my need for God. And those people who are in that place, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Verse 4, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted, right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 talks about that God is the God of all comfort and that those who he comforts, he then equips them to comfort others, all right? That, that God comforts those who are in times of mourning. So whether you experienced grief because of the loss of a loved one or, right, or the, the loss of future plans you had for your life that are no longer going to happen, right? It says in Proverbs that hope deferred makes the heart sick, right? Where we can just kind of like be resilient and just like our hopefulness and sometimes just life just keeps kind of hitting us down and we're just like, man, when is this ever going to end? And, and it's, it can break your heart. But, but Jesus, right, is saying that you're blessed when you are in a season of mourning, right? That's not how I would have measured a good year. That's not how I would have measured better. But he says, 
God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Right? God is an ever-present help in time of need. Right? God is active. He is near you. He is comforting you as you face those tough seasons of your life. Right? And, and the, the world in which we live, we should have, I guess, tempered expectations where we're not hoping that this earth is where heaven will be for us. Right? Recognizing that like, this life is going to encounter death and suffering and sickness. Right? That this life is not the place in which we're building our kingdom. We're invested in a future kingdom. Right? That that's where our hope is in. Our hope is not in somehow people all suddenly treating us nice and doing the right thing. We're going to do the right thing regardless of how we're treated. Right? And so God is going to comfort those who are going through seasons of mourning. Verse 5, God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. Right? So kind of once again pointing out like this, this idea of pride not being something that measures our, our success, right? It measures what is good or better for us. Uh, the classic translation is God blesses those who are meek, all right? And, and meekness is not weakness. Meekness is, is controlled strength. It's restrained strength. All right, one of the ways I guess I, I could uh, kind of convey this is, is Jesus said that in this world, when people have authority, they lord it over other people. They kind of uh, domineer and oppress other people when they have authority. But Jesus said that's not how things work in his kingdom. He says that those who are in authority are to serve everyone. They are a servant of all. All right, and so that's an example of meekness where strength is not used to please oneself, it says in Romans 15, but strength is used to serve others. That's the purpose of strength. And so meekness is choosing to use your strength in service of others and not thinking so highly of yourself. And those are the ones that God will bless. Even though they might appear to be behind the scenes, they might appear to not have all of the success but they're willing to think less of themselves and think more of God and more of other people. Verse 6, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. All right, so uh, justice is a matter that's close to the heart of God. It says in the Bible that if you ignore justice for the orphan and the widow, that God doesn't even want to hear your prayers Right? That's like, kind of like a crazy thing. So like, it's easy to just be like, no, it's just going to be a me and God thing and I'll just ignore everybody else. No, no, no. Like, God cares about us pursuing justice for those who have no voice. But this verse, the more classic translation is God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, which, which righteousness being established on the earth does tie into God setting things right, justice coming, right? Where like God's going to make everything right. All things will be made fair in the end. We don't see that right now. All right. But, but righteousness, having a hunger and thirst for righteousness, I think is more of, a, of an inward thing. Having a desire to become more like Jesus because I recognize the damage that my own sin does to me and those around me. Right? Having this hunger of like, God, I want to be more like you. I'm, I'm sick of this battle with my flesh. Right? I just want to pursue you and everything I do. Like, right? That's the, the person that God wants to bless. And I just want to point out, we don't always have that hunger. All right? I don't always have that hunger. Right? We just kind of tend to move towards that which is convenient. Right? Like if you're setting a resolution regarding your diet and exercise, like you've got to hunger the health more than you hunger right, the cake. Right? And that's kind of like the trade-off here. That's what it's talking about. Like you need to hunger righteousness more than you crave the sin is the idea. Uh, my friend Emmy says it this way. He says, if, if you're friends with your sin, you'll never put to death your sin. You'll never kill your sin because you don't kill that which you're friends with. All right, you don't kill your friends, all right? And maybe that's news to you guys. But, uh, but right, the idea is that uh, we need to put to death the members in our body that are, are sinful, right, that are working against us, that are, our spirit and our flesh are at war with one another. And we've got to hunger God's righteousness. We've got to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, Jesus picks up later on in Matthew chapter 7, right? And, and when you recognize you don't have that hunger complacency is not a good measurement 
of priority, okay? Like, just because I don't think something's important uh, doesn't mean that it suddenly, like, reorders into, like, oh, actually, it isn't important. Brian, you're right. Like, that isn't something that's important because you didn't feel it was that important at the time, right? That's not actually the case. My, my own desires for something don't measure accurately its significance in my life. All right, so when, when I find myself not hungering righteousness, sometimes I'm wise enough to recognize it, not always, but pray for that hunger, right? Ask God to give you that desire because you're like, God, like, I kind of don't even feel like, you know, doing this Christian thing right now. I just kind of feel like doing my own thing, right? You can recognize that about yourself and you can ask that God would grant you that hunger. So get, get hungry for God's righteousness. Verse 7, it says, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. <coughs> so God blesses those who experienced an injustice against themselves, but choose to surrender vengeance, choose to surrender even justice for their own sake, to show mercy. Right? Rather than bringing down wrath on a person who may be acting as their enemy, they choose to show mercy. And that's a person that God blesses. Right? That's a person that God blesses. So like, Jesus kind of expands on this idea in uh, the idea of right, turning the other cheek when a wicked person strikes you in the face. Right? Like that's an example of showing mercy rather than seeking vengeance. Or, or he, he kind of conveys that same information when talking about Right, kind of what's classically called the Our Father, the prayer, where he kind of like clarifies and says, right, we pray for God's forgiveness as we forgive those who sin against us. Right? And so, so he kind of solidifies what he's implying here later on, but right, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. They will be shown mercy. Let's see, verse 8. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. All right? God blesses those whose hearts are pure. So this uh, suggests, this implies that it's possible for someone's heart to be impure. Right? That Jesus is making a distinction because there's a difference between these things. It's possible to have a heart that's pure. It's possible to have a heart that is defiled. All right? And, and, and the default state of humanity is one where we enter this world in a, in a state of just selfishness and pursuing ourselves and making idols and worshiping everything except God, our creator who loves us and pursues us and saves us, right? And that we have this tendency to pursue all of these other things, that our hearts are defiled. And, and Jesus kind of clarifies this in Matthew 7, or Mark 7. He also, uh, there's a passage in Matthew as well, the same thing. Uh, but it says this, and he, he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. So Jesus points out like the problem with humanity isn't the environment that we find ourselves in. We can't blame it on how our parents raised us. We can't blame it on the things that we encountered in this life. He says it's, it's within us, right? That's the problem with our hearts, right? It's, it's our hearts are unclean. Our hearts need Jesus to purify them. And once we experience God's cleansing, once we experience God's salvation, then our hearts can be made pure and then Jesus says, we will see God, all right? Uh, Jesus says this as well in John chapter 3 when a, a religious leader comes and asks him uh, in the middle of the night because he doesn't want people to know that he's like kind of seeking Jesus. And Jesus said this, he says that you must be born again, that if you're not born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. Right? And so this kind of same idea, that the, the parallel of, right, you will see God when your hearts are made pure, right? And we can see the kingdom of God once we experience being born again, born of the Spirit. Right? That we're all born of the flesh, right? We're all here. We've got a body, but our flesh is defiled. Our flesh, right, rebels against God, and we need to experience this spiritual birth where God makes us a new 
creation in Christ Jesus, where we are the righteousness of God found in Christ, right? That's the new creation we need to experience. And when we, when we have that, our hearts are made pure, and then we can, we can see God as he is. Let's see verse 9 back in the Beatitudes. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Right? The idea of peacemakers, those who are pursuing peace, those who are maintaining peace, those who are creating a community of peace. Like God blesses those people, those people who w- might find themselves amid violence and suffering, right? but are still pursuing peace nonetheless, that they will be called the children of God. What, what I want to point out here is that this is not the means by which we are made into children of God. We, we talked about that. We looked at some verses on uh, Christmas Eve that, that God became a man, God became a child when Jesus was born to save us, that we could be made children of God. All right, so just like pursuing peace or having a desire for peace or praying for peace, that's not what suddenly makes you a child of God. Becoming a child of God is when you get adopted into his family as a result of trusting Jesus for the sacrifice he made for your sins. All right, but once you are a child of God, you will pursue peace. Right? You will pursue peace. Let's see, verse 10. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus claims that this is a good thing. All right? That if you just experienced a year where you did the right thing and life got worse because you did the right thing, Jesus is like, that was an awesome year. Right? Like, that was worth it. And, and, like, that's kind of like, no, like, I did the right thing. Like, shouldn't, like, I don't know, like, karma or something. And Jesus like, no, no, no. Like, don't worry about that. Like, that was a good year. When you did what was right in the midst of being treated wrong, and then life got worse for you after you did the right thing. Right? God blesses you when you find yourself in that situation. Right? That's not how it feels in the moment at all. Right? But God blesses you when you do the right thing in the midst of being treated wrong. And, and I want to suggest, like, that's far better than the alternative. Because the alternative is, is uh, avoiding that persecution, avoiding that pain, right? Uh, uh, maintaining comfort at the exchange of our integrity, at the surrender of what's right, right? Being willing to do the wrong thing and compromise just to kind of make life easier for ourselves, that's the alternative to what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is saying, that's not worth it. You do not want to do that, right? It's more important that you kind of are resilient in doing that which is right, even when you're, doing, right, when you're encountering wrong, all right? That, that's more important, that you, you need to kind of uh, be diligent. You need to not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap, okay? But you're, you're going to, at times, Life will get harder, right? People will hate you as a result of your doing the right thing. All right, verse 11, Jesus expands on this. He says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. All right, now, now if people are saying those things about us because we've like <laughs> earned a reputation all right, that might be on us, right? Sometimes, right, we just do foolish things. But, but Jesus is saying, like, when you are following him, when you are doing the right thing, and people mistreat you, like, you're blessed. You are blessed. And he says, this is how you should respond. This is not how you feel, but this is how you respond. Verse 12, be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And then like, but then like, but we're like, but God, like I feel so alone, like I'm doing the right thing, but everyone's mistreating me. And and then Jesus says this, and remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. You're not the only one, right? You're not alone in this, right? That you will experience difficulty and all of those who have done right and followed God before you have encountered the same exact thing. So you're not alone, all right? So don't be discouraged because of that. Let's see, I want to quickly read through Luke's summary of either the similar sermon or the same sermon that Jesus preached uh, in Luke 6, verse 20. And he says this, 
uh, God blesses you who are poor for the kingdom of God is yours. All right, so it's kind of like less metaphorical and more literal here. And, and being poor in this context is not just a, a means of, of not having financial provision. Being poor was that of uh, being an outcast of society, right? Whether because of the sins you have or because of the sickness you have, or, right? Or it could have been poverty, right? Like people might view you as a burden or something like that. But Jesus is saying, listen, like he came to preach the good news to the poor is what he came to do, right? To set the, those who are captive free. And so he's saying like, God blesses you who are poor for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now for you will be satisfied. I like the tense that Luke uses compared to Matthew where he says what you're experiencing now compared to what you will experience, right? Uh, God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When that happens, be happy. And I like this. Yes, leap for joy. Okay, so like even just like more exuberant in our excitement when we experience injustice. Uh, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets the same way. All right, so just this idea of don't measure the quality of your life based on what you're feeling now, okay? Measure the quality of your life and the season of your life based on what you're planting and investing in for a future harvest, what's coming and what awaits you. So much so that you're willing to dance and jump and sing with joy about it even when you're still in the season of suffering. Right? That's what Jesus talks about. And what's interesting is, is Luke uh, writes more than Matthew did. Uh, because Jesus actually didn't just say all of these in the positive. He actually contrasted them with the negative. Where he's got a list of, of woes. W-O-E, woe. Like an unfortunate event is about to happen. Woe unto these people. Check out this in verse 24. Uh, our translation, instead of saying woe, says, What sorrow awaits. So here's a future outcome compared to someone else's present experience. What sorrow awaits you who are rich, for you have your only happiness now, right? So someone might be in a season of happiness and think like, life is going great, when in reality, maybe they're, they're setting themselves up for future failure. Uh, what sorrow awaits, verse 25, you who are fat and prosperous now, uh, for a time of awful hunger awaits you, what sorrow awaits you who laugh now, for your laughing will be turned to mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds, for their ancestors also praised false prophets. And so when Jesus talks about what's better or worse, notice that he, he says you can't measure that by what you're experiencing now. It's all about where you're going, where your destination is, where you're investing in for your future, all right? And, and that you don't want to measure your life based on this happiness or contentment or joy that you have right now. You want to measure, like, is your joy found in God? Is your investment found in God's kingdom, right? Is your peace found in Christ, right? Is, is that where you find your purpose? Is that where you find your life is made better? Because that is, in reality, the way it is better, right? It's unfortunate that uh, sometimes we can experience praise from the crowds and experience, right, shame from God, where we're doing the things that are against him, but that are getting the, the uh, acclamation of society, right? So Jesus contrasts those ideas. When you do the right thing, you might get cursed and like excluded from the group and all sorts of things but he says it's better than this when you are praised by other people but you're in fact distant from God so let, let me ask you the question again are you better or worse after this last year are you better or worse right and, and just think about like okay like God what kind of what season am I in, in my life am I clinging to this momentary happiness or comfort that I have, or am I willing to be open-handed with my life and just kind of, Lord, wherever you lead me, I'm willing to, you know, kind of let some of those things lay aside if you call me elsewhere. 
What are you calling me to? Right? Are, are you going to make exactly the same types of decisions this year as you did last? Are you going to do anything different this year? Right? I mean, if, if things are going well, if you're pursuing Jesus, if you're like praying and growing, just continue to do those things. You don't need to start spinning more plates just for the sake of it. Right? But if you find you're making choices, you're making decisions, you're focusing on the wrong things, right? start making some changes. Become more like Jesus. Start investing in his kingdom and not just building your own. I'm going to ask that you don't just choose the easy life for this year. See, as our worship team comes back up, I want to put Matthew 7 up on the screen. So this is from the same sermon that Jesus preached. He says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for, many who cho- for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. So that's what I ask of you guys is that this year make a choice to be willing to live a difficult life to enter the narrow gate, right? Live a life that you are going to be able to look back on from eternity with joy and satisfaction, right? Those things that we have done wrong, make those situations right, right? Remedy those relationships that are broken, right? Acknowledge the wrong that we've done before God when he's the only one we sinned against, right? Make those situations right. And then don't just be content to just be like, Well, thanks for your forgiveness, Jesus. Like, going to do the same thing, right? Like, make a choice to pursue a different plan. Like, have a different agenda for your life in this coming year. And if you mess up, like, this afternoon, don't worry about it. Because, like like I said, God's mercy is new every day. So you don't have to just, like, commit to ruining a whole year of your life and just be like, well, next year's resolution will be the one that counts. No, you don't have to do that. All right, so let's, let's just pray real quick, and then we'll sing a couple more songs. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that you are at work in us for your glory. I thank you, God, that you are growing us to become more and more like you. Uh, That, Lord, you've produced so much change in our church family over these years of our lives. And that, God, you are at work in us for our good. I thank you, Lord, for helping us overcome sin I pray, God, that you would give us a resilience, a determination that we would continue to fight the sin in our own lives. That, Lord, we would no longer remain as slaves to that bondage. But, God, I thank you that you set us free. You offer us forgiveness. I thank you that we have the hope of a new day. And that, Lord, you are our hope. We place all of our hope in you. I thank you that it's not on our own uh, self-control that we hang our hope, God, but you, through the Holy Spirit, are working in us, uh, developing fruit in our lives for your glory and and for the enjoyment of the people around us. That, Holy Spirit, you will give us the self-control we need and that you give us the mercy we need when we do fail. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be still.